Good afternoon. Um, many of you uh, seem familiar to me, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Katie Ness. I'm one of our uh, program assistants here at OLLI. Um, welcome back for this new term. Um, welcome if this is your first term. Um, we're glad to have you here at OLLI. Uh, today we will be hearing about climate change from um, Mike Clancy, who is uh, joins the Navy's uh, Fleet Numerical Meteorology Fleet Numerical Meteorology and Geography <laughs> Center <laughs> in 1983 um, and became the Technical and Scientific Director in 2005. He has authored um, over 100 publications in meteorology and oceanography and received over 50 professional awards, including the Navy's highest civilian awards. So um, we're lucky to have him here speaking with us today. So if you'll all give, us, uh, give a warm welcome to um, Mike Clancy. Thanks to Katie and Michelle for setting us up. And most of all, thanks to all of you for coming today. I really appreciate it. Um, I think we show you uh, an outline for what we're going to be talking about today. Um, start out with uh, sort of introduction and context on climate change. And then I'm going to uh, go into an historical perspective to show you how well grounded the science is in the history of this thing. Then we're going to focus on this. Yes. Um, what's happening with climate change denial? What's behind the, the whole climate change denial movement? We're going into some detail on that. And then here is really sort of the, um, the meat of the course, where I'm going to be talking about climate change denial myths. I sort of picked what I believe are the most common ones and kind of put them in, a, in a sort of logical order. It starts out with, well, it's not happening. Okay, it's happening, but it's not climate change. It's the sun. Uh, okay, it's CO2, but it's far too low to cause global warming. Okay, it's CO2, but CO2 is coming from volcanoes of the ocean, not uh, acid fuels. They can't predict the weather 10 days from now. They can't predict the surface. So they can't predict the climate of the from now. Data coverage is sufficient. And finally, okay, it's happening. It's caused by humans, but it's a good thing. So we're going to cover all of those, and we'll have some closing comments. Here. And, and by the way, if, 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 you have, if you've heard other things you want to address, other myths, just raise them in, and I'll, I'll talk to them in, in the um, question and answer period. Hopefully we'll get through this in time to have a plenty of time for question and answer. So if you have sort of your favorite myths you've heard, you know, bring those up at that time. We'll take a 10 minute break at about the one hour mark. So jumping in on introduction and context. Uh, this is a plot of the global mean surface temperature of the Earth by year from 1850 to 2017 <laughs> from five different sources, the J Japanese Meteorological Agency, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, the United Kingdom Meteorological Office, and then two American products, a NASA product and a NOAA product. And all five of these products, independent, produced by independent groups, independent uh, data sets, to a great degree. Some use satellite data, some don't. Some use models, some don't. Um, they all paint the same picture. And the picture as is, is as follows. Not much happening from 1850 to 1880. A slight decline from 1880 to 1910. And then a rapid upward movement from 1910 to 1945. A little bit of decline from 45 to 75. And then beginning about the mid-70s to the current time, a significant upward movement in the global mean surface temperature of the Earth. Now, a couple other things to look to notice here. Number one, the temperature doesn't go up in a straight line. There are these zigs and zags here. It's kind of like volatility in the stock market. The stock market doesn't go up in a straight line. There are zigs and zags. You know, there's like day-to-day -day volatility. There are periods of bear markets right here. But ultimately, just as the stock market ultimately goes up, what we're seeing here is an upward march of temperatures. Notice there's a fair amount of discrepancy, disagreement among the, the five different products here. But as we get into the modern era, with all the mass amount of data we have, particularly from satellites, there's a very high degree, uh, there's a very high degree of agreement among the five different products. So I'd like to show you an animation of one of these. I'm going to show you an animation of the, the NASA product, and it's going to be a global animation from 1880 to 2018, and what we're going to be looking at will be temperature anomaly. Now, a temperature anomaly is just a fancy way of saying temperature difference, a difference from some reference value. 
And the reference value is going to be uh, the 1951 to 1980 average over the space of your year. And the temperature scale here is shown up here. So where it's depicted as white, that means the temperature doesn't differ from that 30-year average, 51 to 1980. Where it's yellow or orange, it's warmer. Yellows are 0 to 1 degree centigrade warm. And the oranges are up to 2 degrees centigrade warm. The darker the orange, the warmer the product. And conversely, the blues are cold. The darker the blue, the colder the colder it is. Now, I'm going to call out the years or the decades as the animation goes by. Pay particular attention to what happens beginning in the 1970s. As we saw in the previous chart, temperatures really took off in the 1970s. So I'll call that out. Pay particular attention to what happens there. Then the video will stop, and we'll draw some conclusions from that. So here we go. Okay, so we're in the uh, 1900s, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, here's the 70s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000, 2010s, 2014. So a couple things about this data set first. First of all, there's a lot of data here. Over the oceans, it's about 450 million observations over this period of time, mainly from ships, but in recent years also from drifting buoys. Over the land, it's several billion observations. There are 26,000 land stations around the world, uh, 26,000 land stations reporting hourly, oftentimes at least twice a day. So actually billions of observations over uh, the land, no, no computer models here, no satellite data, just in situ observations, which means observations made in place. You might have heard about the urban heat island effect, that's a favorite climate denial uh, thing, that's the urban heat island, it's really not real, not true. The urban, there's 270 stations that are contaminated by urban heat island effect, they're excluded from this analysis, so no urban heat island effect here. You might be aware that before 1920, ships made observations of sea surface temperature by throwing a bucket over the side, scooping up the water, bringing it up on, on deck, and then sticking it on and measuring that, particularly in the days of sailing ships. Between 1920 and 1960, there was a transition towards using in, uh, engine room injection temperature as we moved away from sailing ships to much faster moving ships. The reason why that's important is the uh, bucket temperatures were biased, cooled by about a tenth of a degree centigrade, lots of studies on that. And the engine room in injection temperatures have been found to be biased warm by about two tenths of a degree centigrade. So three tenths of a degree centigrade bias, that's actually pretty significant. Well, don't worry about that. It's been corrected out. Very carefully corrected out in this data set. Not a problem. So, let's take this picture and draw a couple of conclusions. First of all, the land is warming faster than the sea. Notice that the land is warming about, actually about twice as fast as the ocean. Even though about 95% of the heat of global warming is going into the ocean. The reason why the ocean is warming slower is because the ocean has much higher heat capacity. It can absorb a lot more heat without warming up as much. But the ocean is warming, that's for sure. Notice all the yellows there. The higher the latitude, the more it's warming. It's warming a lot more in the Arctic than it is in the mid-latitudes. And that's a bad thing, because that's where all the ice is, of course. And that melting ice is giving rise to, to sea level rise. It's warming more in the western third of the United States than the eastern third, where we live. It isn't warming all that much in certain, certain areas. So uh, that's something to be aware of. It's not warming everywhere. Notice that um, there are some blue areas here. So what's going on here? What's, what's going on? Do we understand this? And the answer is absolutely we do understand this. And it's actually the greenhouse effect, which is really not that uh, complicated of a thing. Basically, uh, and what we're looking at here on this chart is um, a, a chart uh, or a graph of the uh, energy balance of, of the Earth, the uh, annually average global mean energy balance of the Earth. And these numbers here are watts per square meter, talking about flow of energy. And what we see here is, of course, is that the Earth is warm by the sun. Incoming solar radiation warms the Earth, and the Earth is cooled by reflected solar or reflected solar radiation, which is reflected from clouds and aerosols in the atmosphere. Aerosols are, are volcanic ash and dust and, and pollution, things like that, and also cooled by reflections from the surface, mainly areas of snow and ice. Now, the Earth is cooled by outgoing long wave radiation, also known as infrared radiation, and the problem is that infrared radiation 
is trapped by greenhouse gases. Now, that's actually a good thing, because we need these greenhouse gases, we need that trapping. If, if you could suddenly wave a magic wand and eliminate the greenhouse properties here of these gases, then the Earth would go into a permanent ice age. And here in Monterey, we'd be covered by ice sheet hundreds of years thick. So the greenhouse effect is, is actually a good thing. It's kind of like a blanket. You go to sleep at night, and you want a blanket over you. But what happens if somebody keeps laying more and more blankets on top of you? Pretty soon you get too hot. Well, that's what's happening, is uh, human activities are laying more and more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, particularly the ones I've highlighted here in uh, purple. And that's what's causing the warming we're seeing. So let's take a look at these greenhouse gases. Uh, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and the fluorinated gases, the F gases. These are gases, that, these are man-made gases, which have fluorine as part of the molecule. It turns out, in terms of potency, the potency rate actually goes up as you go down the table. But fortunately, there isn't much of these gases in the atmosphere. But there's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. And as a result, CO2 is the dominant greenhouse gas, leading to the uh, current rate of global warming. This is a snapshot in time. This is the current rate of global warming. It takes into account the potency of the gas and how much gas there is in the atmosphere. It doesn't worry about the lifetime of the gas. How long does it stay in the atmosphere? So let's take a look at uh, more a closer look at carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is normally reported and measured in parts per million. And prior to the Industrial Revolution, uh, CO2 was running at about 280 parts per million. And then you can see, beginning here with the Industrial Revolution, particularly ramping up in the 50s, it really started climbing, such that now we're well above 400 parts per million. It's also useful to talk about, which is about 50% above the pre-industrial level. It's also uh, instructive to think about the total mass of CO2 in the atmosphere. From 1850 to 2018, humans emitted about 2 trillion tons, not billion, 2 trillion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, and uh, now we're running about 1.1 trillion tons above the pre-industrial level. Imagine what a trillion tons of CO2 looks like. And currently we're putting about 40 billion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere per year. We're putting CO2 in the atmosphere at about twice the rate the natural carbon cycle can take it out. About 30% of the CO2 we put in the atmosphere goes into the ground, is, is sequestered into the ground, which is great, that's what we want. About 20% goes into the ocean, gets dissolved in the ocean, and that's a good thing it's not in the atmosphere, but it's a bad thing because it has negative impacts on the ocean, particularly ocean acidification, which we'll talk a little bit about. And the remaining 50% goes in the atmosphere and contributes to global warming. So roughly we're putting about CO2 into the atmosphere about twice as fast as the, the uh, carbon cycle can take it out. So to get to where we want to be, which is carbon neutral, which means we're putting the same amount of carbon into the atmosphere every year that natural world is taking out, we need to cut global emissions by about a factor of two. That's the goal of the Paris Climate Accord, and that's a pretty tough thing to do. That's going to be a tough goal to achieve. We're currently putting about 40 billion tons per year into the atmosphere. Now this is not just me talking. This is, this is the, there's, a, there's an overwhelming international scientific consensus on this matter. Now I'm just simply presenting the, the overwhelming international scientific consensus, including um, three of the most prestigious organizations in science in the United States, that would be the National Academy of Sciences, the National Research Council, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and also the two organizations that uh, have the lead in matters pertaining to the atmosphere and the ocean, the American Meteorological Society and the American Geophysical Union. So overwhelming international scientific convention, or I should say, uh, agreement on this matter. Well, I want to now do a little historical perspective for two reasons. One, to honor the people who made these contributions over the years to understanding this, but also to give you a sense of where this science came from. It's not just something that popped up and all of a sudden here's the deal. It goes back to the, to the 1800s, as my uh, friend and uh, former Navy colleague, Emerald Dave, did, likes to say, climate change is cutting edge 19th century science. A lot of stuff was figured out back in the 1800s, and you'll we'll see that right here. And it actually all began with Joseph Fourier. Yes, the same Joseph Fourier who invented Fourier series, for those of you who study math or physics in, in, uh, in school. Uh, just to set the context, he was a scientific advisor to Napoleon Bonaparte way back then. He was one of the world's great mathematicians, 
but he was also a physicist and he studied uh, heat flow. He was the first to propose the greenhouse effect. Never used that term, but he was the first to say, well, the atmosphere must be trapping heat. It must be trapping. Otherwise, the, Earth would, the average temperature of the Earth would be about the same as the average temperature of the Moon. The Moon has no atmosphere. What's the difference? We have an atmosphere that traps the heat. We're both the same distance from the sun, so we should be about the same temperature, but the Earth is much, much warmer than this because the atmosphere traps the heat. So he was the first one to start talking about this and writing about this. He was followed up by John Tyndall, a great Irish physicist, uh, worked in many areas, and he proved Fourier's hypothesis that the Earth atmosphere warms the Earth like the greenhouse by actually measuring the infrared absorbing, absor absorbing properties of atmospheric gases in the laboratory, or laboratory as he would. <laughs> and he showed that water vapor is the most powerful greenhouse gas, but also noted the importance of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. The next player in this saga is Slante Arrhenius. Um, he's, he's often referred to as the father of climate change. Um, he was a Nobel Prize winning Swedish chemist. He made fundamental contributions in the years. He actually invented the whole um, discipline of physical chemistry. And he was the first to calculate the warming of the Earth due to increasing atmospheric CO2. He worked out a lot of the theory of this, just you know, way, way before computers worked it out on this mm -hmm. paper. And uh, he concluded that human-caused CO2 emissions from fossil fuels were large enough to have an impact. He had no direct measurement of that, but just from his calculations, he concluded it was large enough to have an impact. And he also showed that doubling the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere would cause the same amount of fixed amount of warming once the atmosphere reaches equilibrium, every time you double the CO2, it would result in that same amount of warming. And that same amount of warming has been called, a, has been come to known as the climate, the equilibrium climate sensitivity. That's a parameter which we still worry about a lot today. A lot of people talk about that today. He's the guy who came up with that. And he estimated that to be 4 degrees centigrade. If you double the CO2 and let the atmosphere come to the equilibrium, he concluded that the atmosphere would warm by 4 degrees centigrade. Um, now this gentleman, Milutin Milankovic, wasn't concerned with CO2 and those sorts of things, but still he's a major player in this because he's a serving mathematician, astronomer, and climatologist, geophysicist, who discovered that the orbital variations of the Earth um, play a significant role in deriving the ice age cycle. That's important because you know the global warming we're concerned with is occurring against the backdrop of natural climate change and the thing that dominates natural climate change has the last couple million years, is the ice age cycle. And he figured out what the ice age cycle is all about. So he was actually a major player in all of this. And we're going to come back to his stuff later on. Now, this fellow is an interesting character, Guy Stewart Calder. He was not a scientist. He was a, a steam engineer and inventor. But he pursued climatology as a hobby. And he was the first to analyze global temperature measurements and show that the post-industrial Earth was indeed warming. He did this all in his spare time, like on the weekends. You know? <laughs> and this is before the days of electronic calculators, and they showed him mechanical calculators. So you can imagine him laboriously with pencil and paper gathering these weather reports from all around the world, and working, 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 and finally came to the conclusion that indeed the uh, Earth is warming. And he estimated the uh, equilibrium climate sensitivity at 2 degrees centigrade. Well, here's an interesting thing. If you take the average of his estimate for climate sensitivity and Arrhenius's, you come up with 3 degrees centigrade. Well, that's the modern value. You know, well, before, well before there were satellites, computers, computer models, these guys between the two of them pretty much figured out what the equilibrium climate sensitivity of the Earth is, 3 degrees centigrade. And that's pretty well established nowadays. So, pretty impressive. Uh, Charles Keeling, getting kind of close to home. Uh, Keeling was an oceanographer down at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla. And uh, he was the first to make very accurate long-term measurements of atmospheric CO2. You'll often hear the term the Keeling curve. The Keeling curve uh, is, looks like this. Sometimes you see it with sort of the sawtooth here. That's when you're, you're plotting it monthly. And he was the first to show there was an annual cycle. CO2 peaks in April and is at minimum in October. Sometimes you see the smooth version of the curve. Whenever you see reference to Mauna Loa, and that refers to the observational series that, that Keeling started. And uh, he was awarded the National Medal of Science, this is George Bush handing him the National Medal of Science in 2002 for those contributions. And finally, I had to pick someone to represent the modern era, and there's a lot of names I could have come up with, but 
I chose James Hansen, and I think it was a pretty good choice. Um, he is an American scientist who headed the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Sciences um, during this period of time. That, uh, that uh, animation I showed you was produced by his group there. And he also led the team that pioneered the development of uh, using uh, global computer models to map to model climate and predict the future of climate. Also, his, his 1988 congressional testimony really was a landmark event that it broadly introduced the public to, to, to the concerns and political leaders to, to the concerns of, um, of global warming. He's also served as a well-known um, uh, advocate for climate activism and a role model for many scientists in this regard. So I would pick James Hansen as kind of the guy who made it the transitional person between sort of those older days and, and the modern era of climate science. So, what's up with climate change denial? Climate, I mean, the science is well established. There's really no doubt about it scientifically. The science is settled, but obviously the politics are not settled. So why is that? Well, here's an example. There, there, there's a die the wool climate denial community out there. And uh, here's some examples of that. You know, global warming is a huge fraud. I love CO2. <laughs> clean carbon neutral coal. Clean carbon neutral coal. Two lies on one. Two lies on one. <laughs> one uh, poster here. You know, coal is the dirtiest burning of all the fossil fuels by far. And there's no such thing as carbon neutral coal. You know, if you're, you're burning coal, you're putting carbon in the atmosphere. It's not good. Total clip to the truth. This is one of my favorite. Um, we're going to actually address it. It's the sun. You know, it's not carbon emissions. The sun's driving everything. So I see, uh, and, and it's backed up by uh, pseudoscience literature. There's all these books out there. There's lots of websites out there. Dozens, if not hundreds, of climate denial websites out there. Lots of books, you know, climate denial, you know, man made global warming hoax exposed, climate warming global hoax. Here's poor Al Gore with a headache. <laughs> I see, quite frankly, a lot of parallels uh, between the climate denial community and the Flat Earth Society. Um, this gentleman here is the president of the U.S. chapter of the Flat Earth Society, and you can find lots of, of uh, him out there on YouTube. Just, just, just uh, go ahead and Google Flat Earth Society on YouTube. Here he's showing their model of, of the Earth. It's a flat disk. The water doesn't fall off because there's a ring of ice all the way around here, which we erroneously describe as, as um, Antarctica. And just like uh, the climate denial community, the Flat Earth Society is backed up by a, a wide range of, of um, pseudoscience literature. There's lots of books out here, Flat Earth Theory. Uh, 100 proofs. If you don't, if one's not enough for you, you gotta, you got 99 more. 100 proofs why the Earth is not a globe. <clears throat> Just like the Flat Earth Society, which leans heavily towards conspiracy theories, the same is true of the climate denial community. The Flat Earth Society believes that there's this huge conspiracy that's been going on for 500 years to deceive people with thinking they want to blow up the fact it's a flat disk. And indeed, the um, climate denial community believes there's a huge conspiracy among all the scientists of the world and so forth to, to perpetrate this hoax. So having said all of that, and recognize they lean pretty heavily towards conspiracy theories. I have to tell you that there's one thing I really do heavily admire and respect about the Flat Earth Society, and that is they got really cool t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> now this one was probably done by uh, a Flat Earther who had a backyard telescope. So he notices that some of the other planets are spherical, but you know, ours is, is flat here. <laughs> Here's one done by NASA. <laughs> Not flat in the <laughs> But here's my favorite one of all. Here's my favorite one of all. Butter Society. Members around the <laughs> Okay, so to get a little more
more serious, I would like to read to you uh, an article that was published on the effect of CO2 on climate. I'll read it to you verbatim. There is evidence that the amount of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere is increasing rapidly as a result of the combustion of fossil fuels. If the future rate of increase continues at its present, it has been predicted that because the CO2 envelope reduces radiation, the temperature of the Earth's atmosphere will increase and that vast changes in the climate of the Earth will result. Such changes in temperature will cause melting of the polar ice caps, which in turn would result in the inundation of many coastal cities, including New York and London. This is a remarkable statement. Why is it remarkable? Not because what it says, but rather because who said it and when it was said. In fact, it was said by the coal industry in 1966. Oh, wow. It was published in the Mining Congress Journal in 1966 by you know, a leader of the coal industry. And this is not unique, because there, you've probably seen in the news in recent years it's come to light that um, some of the big oil companies like ExxonMobil, and we're doing a lot of their own research, internal research, they, they came to the same conclusion back in the 50s and 60s, and they covered it up. They covered it up because they didn't want to have to stop selling their product. Very much like that. Now, the fossil fuel industry has organized a climate den denial campaign to disseminate dis disinformation to the public for decades, it's to make create the appearance of scientific controversy where there is none. This strategy is completely analogous, completely and perfectly analogous to the organized denial of the hazardous smoking by the tobacco industry in the 50s through the 70s. It is completely analogous to that. Uh, the campaign to undermine public trust in climate science has been described as a denial machine and is largely carried out by about 90 think tanks advocacy organizations and trade associations that are funded at about a billion dollars a year. So there's a lot of money behind this. Much of this funding comes from the fossil fuel industry itself, as well as from conservative billionaires and foundations, often working through secretive funding networks. And the organized climate denial, change denial, has had a significant political impact by creating doubt in the public and, as a result, inaction among politicians and thus undermining the federal government's resolve to deal with climate change, completely analogous to what the tobacco industry did in the 50s to the 70s, mm -hmm. creating doubt. Is it really, you know, okay, we've seen, you know, what, what the you know, tobacco industry saw was there was these, you know, health concerns, people were dying of heart attacks, people at an increasing rate, people were dying of lung cancer at an increasing rate, so they looked around and funded, you know, a whole, uh, uh, bunch of research to try to come up with alternate solutions, alternate explanations for that. It can't be our body, it can't be something else. This is completely analogous to that. Ultimately, however, the efforts of the climate change non community will fail, just as the efforts of the tobacco industry uh, to deny the health hazards of their product ultimately fail. And government will, will be able to act more decisively in dealing with climate change. And there's some good news here. There was a recent poll uh, just came out a couple of months ago, September 2019, CBS poll. About 91% of those responding agree that the Earth is experiencing climate change in some way. That's really high. About 70% agree activity can, agree that human activity contributes a lot or some to climate change. And finally, about 64% agree that climate change is a serious problem. These are pretty darn good numbers. And I can tell you, about 10 years ago, they would be in, have been about 30% below this. It's come up about 30% over the last 10 years. So that's very positive. And that's happened even in uh, response to all the efforts of the climate change denial community and the, the money behind them to obfuscate the situation. Now, it's going to take time for our political leaders to catch up to the public on this issue, but eventually they will. And the arguments that have been put forward by the climate change denial community will someday seem as wrong and out of place as the 1950s cigarette ad, which I share my <laughs> Here's your doctors in the 50s home. Here's my favorite cigarette and go smoke it. Okay, so that's kind of the introduction. Now we're going to go into climate change denial myths. So we're moving good, we're making good time here. Now this part gets pretty science intensive. And if uh, it's not making sense to you or you're unclear what I'm showing you, please raise your hand and, and ask me to explain a little bit more. Because I can tell you it's going to get real geeky. It's going to get real sciencey, and we're going to stick right in there. Um, you're going to like it. We'll, we'll get through it. <laughs> so the first, the first um, myth is it's not happening. I think this. I, I believe this has been 
over the years the most common myth. It's probably dying off a little bit now. It's getting increasingly hard for people to deny it, but but uh, for a long time the biggest myth was it's not happening. Okay, so what I did is I went out and randomly found a climate denial website. I wasn't. I just picked the first one I found. And I took a look at some of the stuff they had, and one of the charts they had on was this, this chart right here. And what this shows is, um, in the blue curve here, is um, satellite-based global average lower temperature of the atmosphere. And the, the red line here is just a sort of smooth curve through it. And they say, hey, where's the global warming? And indeed, if you look at this, I don't see any global warming. You know, it starts up here, kind of goes across. It looks to me like it's going across here. It's a 20-year period. Well, the first thing you might think, well, they didn't mess around with data. Well, no, they didn't. This is perfectly validated. There's nothing wrong with this data here. Uh, satellite data is tricky, and there's only a handful of groups around the world that are able to process it to a level of accuracy that's good for climate change studies. But UAH, which is the University of Alabama Huntsville, is one of those groups. And this is a valid data set. There's nothing wrong with this data set. So what's going on here? I mean, if you look at this, you say there's no global warming. What's going on here? Well, the first problem is, first problem is they cherry pick the beginning time to correspond to the 97-98 El Nino, which is one of the strongest El Ninos on record. And when you have an El Nino, that warms the climate because there's a transfer of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere. So the global mean surface temperature goes up. So they picked um, to be near this spike here associated with the El Nino to be the starting point. And then they picked this to be the end point, which is the 2018 La Nina. Reverse happens during a La Nina. Now, just the background, El Nino is that warm outbreak of water along the, you know, along the equator in the Pacific Ocean. La Nina is the opposite, it's cold water along there. It has a big impact on the global main surface temperature of the Earth. And uh, La Nina makes it cold, and El Nino makes it warm. So they mainly start out with, let's, let's put in a bias like this, as best we can. But the real big problem is the time interval. It's a 20 year interval here. And here's the same data, but now shown for a 39 year interval. And the funny thing about it, absolutely hilarious, is this, this graph was taken from the same website, just a little bit farther down. I spent a lot of time talking about the other figure, and then they showed this figure. I didn't really say too much about this one. And if you look at it by eye, you know, it looks like there's an upper trend. The one thing they didn't do was put a trend line through there, so I took the liberty of doing that for them. And what do you know? Here's global warming. In fact, it's warming exactly the same rate that everybody else in the world is saying. Mm -hmm. So this gives rise to um, what I want you to really take home as a as a take home uh, <coughs> away from this, this class, and that's an important rule of thumb. Temperature records short in about 20 years are not useful for drawing conclusions about climate change. You really need to be looking at temperature records longer than about 30 years to draw a valid conclusion. If it's between 20 and 30 years, that's kind of gray area, but you really like to be closer to the 30-year range. So what's the science behind that? Well, to explore the science behind that, we have to talk about the difference between weather, climate variability, and climate change. And the thing that differentiates those three things is increasing time scale and space scale. So what does time scale and space scale mean? Time scale is just a fancy way of, of saying lifetime of a phenomenon. And space scale, just a fancy way of saying, the size of, of the phenomenon. For weather, weather occurs on space scales of about 10 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers, and time scales of minutes to months or a few weeks. And that would include thunderstorms, squall lines, tropical storms, winter storms, blocking patterns in the, in the jet stream. As you go this way, you're going to longer time scales, longer space scales. In the middle here, we have climate variability. Remember those zigs and zags? I said it was like volatility in the stock market. Well, that's what's going on here. This is what causes those zigs and zags. And these are things like El Nino, ENSO, which is the El Nino Southern, Oscill Southern Oscillation, the IOD, which is the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is sort of the Indian Ocean equivalent of El Nino, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which played a role in the collapse of the fisheries in Canada Europe, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, which uh, has an impact on the intensity of hurricane seasons. These are all things that happen on timescales of months to decades. And finally, we have climate change that we're concerned about. Climate change happens on scales of decades to centuries to millennia on out. Climate, climate change and it's global. You know, 
climate variability happens on the scale of about 10,000 kilometers, the scale of the Pacific Ocean, for example. But climate change is a global phenomenon, and it happens on many decades. So if you, you're looking at 30 years or longer, you're confident, confident over here. If you're looking at 20 years or shorter, you're definitely in here. Okay, if you're looking at the late, latest you know, blizzard that hit Washington, you're talking about weather. You're not talking about climate. So it's important to kind of keep that, that in mind. And indeed, just to reinforce, you know, these zigs and zags here, that's climate variability. Well, let's see. So this is, these zigs and zags here are climate variability, not climate change. The overall trend is climate change. And a typical climate change scenario's view is every downward zig marks the end of global warming. Never mind the subsequent upward zags, you know. What you really need to look at is that trend there, not these zigs and zags. Okay. We're making pretty good time here. Remember, court rule of thumb, take this away. Temperature records shorter than 20 years are not useful for drawing conclusions about climate change. You really want to look at records that are 30 years longer, and you really want to be looking at the global answer, as opposed to some location. Okay, now this is this gets really interesting here. We're going to dig a little bit into science, but it'll be good. good. Um, second most common myth is it's it's Natural, it's just natural climate change, you know. I mean, Earth is warm, it's cool in the past, you know, long before there are humans or cars. So, why can you say this is, you know, we're doing it's just natural climate change. And indeed, if you look at um, the temperature record for the Earth going back five million years before the present, you see that beginning about two and a half million years ago, uh, which is the beginning of what's called the Pleistocene epoch, the Earth started going into these ice ages. Now the downward zig here is, we, we refer to as an ice age, but technically it's called a glacial period, and the upper zags are called an interglacial period. And for about the first million and a half years of the Pleistocene, the Earth was on a 40,000 year ice age cycle. So we went through dozens and dozens and dozens of ice ages. And for the last million or so years, we've gone about, we've been on about a 100,000 year ice age cycle. And the, the difference is real large. From the peak of the interglacial period to the glacial period, ice age period, is typically about four to six degrees centigrade. But we've only warmed one degree centigrade since the Industrial Revolution. We're all concerned about that. But these ice age swings are like four to six times that. And um, you know, they had nothing to do with humans because we, we didn't even exist back then. Humans came along about here. Um, Homo sapiens came along about 300,000 years ago. So what's going on there? Well, first of all, let's, let's zoom in a little bit. Or let's talk about what's going on. Remember, I, I mentioned that guy, Milutin Milankovic, the Serbian uh, astronomer. He's the guy who figured this out. And he figured this out about 100 years ago, back in the 1920s. What's driving the ice age cycle are orbital variations of the Earth. And there are a number of orbital variations of the Earth, but there are three that are most important in this problem. And the first is called the eccentricity cycle. It's a 100,000-year cycle. And it's basically the Earth's orbit changing from being more like a circle to more like an ellipse. And the way it works is, in northern hemisphere summer, we're out here, farther from the sun. In northern hemisphere winter, we're closer to the sun. But that ellipse doesn't stay the same. It actually fluctuates back and forth on about a 100,000-year cycle. Now, it's highly exaggerated here. The fluctuation is actually less than 1%. But it's enough to have a big impact. And it's actually the gravitational force of Jupiter and Saturn acting on the Earth that causes that 100,000-year cycle. The second one that's important is the obliquity cycle. As you know, the Earth's orbit is inclined. The Earth's axis is inclined, but it doesn't stay fixed. It rocks back and forth. It rocks back and forth between about 24.5 degrees and 22.5 degrees. Right now, we're kind of in the middle. And uh, that happens on a 41,000-year cycle, driven by the gravitational force of the Sun and the Moon acting on the Earth. And finally, there is a precession cycle, and that is the, the, um, the axis of the Earth actually wobbles, wobbles around like this. Again driven by the gravitational force of the sun and the moon and about, on about a 27,000 year period. So we've understood this for about 100 years, thanks to the work of Milankovic. And the way it comes into play in driving the ice age cycle is as follows. When um, these variations in the Earth's um, orbit conspire to decrease solar radiation striking the Earth during the northern hemisphere summer, so for example, in this case, that would be the, the uh, uh, orbit becoming more elongated. When that happens, that starts to drive us into an ice age. 
And what happens is there is um, uh, decreasing sunlight absorbed by the land and sea because of this variation. That yields decreasing global temperatures. And that yields increasing snow and ice. And this is called the snow ice feedback. Why is it the northern hemisphere that counts? It's because there's more ma land mass in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. And the result, there's more ice and snow on the ground. And that allows the snow ice feedback to, cut, to kick into effect. And you keep going around this. You know, as, as uh, it gets colder, you get increasing temperatures, you get increasing snow and ice, and that yields more snow and ice on the ground. And, yes, sir? Is there a place that we could find this online? Uh, yes. Uh, I think if you just uh, Google Milankovitch, and um, I'll give you that spelling later on, and uh, you can find that on Wikipedia. There's a, there's a pretty nice discussion there. Thank you. And there are two other feedbacks that come into play. So like, these are called feedback loops. Now, a feedback loop is something that can amplify or attenuate a change. They don't drive a change. These three loops here, snow ice feedback, water vapor feedback, and CO2 feedback, don't actually drive the change towards the ice age, but they amplify the effect. What really drives it is these, these local variations of the Earth. And the water vapor feedback is, works like this. Decreasing global temperatures yields decreasing evaporation of water from the ocean and the land. That yields decreasing water vapor in the atmosphere. But because water vapor is a strong greenhouse gas, that traps less heat and that yields uh, uh, more cooling. And you go around this feedback loop and it causes the Earth to cool even more. And a similar thing with CO2. Uh, decreasing release of CO2 from the oceans and the biosphere as the Earth gets colder. That yields decreasing CO2 in the atmosphere, which decreases the global temperatures further because there's less greenhouse trapping. So this is what takes you into the ice age cycle. And what takes you out of the ice age cycle is when these three orbital variations conspire to increase solar radiation striking the Earth during the northern hemisphere summer. So for example, this variation became more like a circle and less like an ellipse. Then you just go around the feedback loop in the opposite direction and it amplifies the warming. Now, the 100,000-year ice age cycle, um, rough numbers goes like this. It takes about 10,000 years to go into an ice age. Uh, you're in the ice age for about 60,000 years. And Yeah, about 60,000 years. In the ice age for about 60,000 years. It takes about 10,000 years to come out of the ice age. And then you're in the interglacial period, the warm period that we're in right now. It's called the Holocene interglacial for about 20,000 years. So it's a long cycle. So that's what's driving the ice age cycle. That's what's driving natural climate change. What so let's zoom in. Yes, ma'am. What was the current period called? The it's called the Holocene. It's H-O-L-O-C-E in the Holocene interglacial. And we're actually going to zoom in on that because now we're going to zoom in over here. And we're going to look at um, temperature going back 22,000 years. Now, this the approximate beginning of human civilization here about 9,000 years ago. This is the last ice age. And here we're coming out of the ice age. This is called the Holocene, this, this blue area here. And this is where we are right now. So there's a couple of identifiable features on this. First of all, this is a recovery from the last ice age. And it's driven by that eccentricity cycle, which is, you know, the orbit becoming less like a ellipse and more like a circle. And here is a cooling trend, which has been happening, uh, you know, for the last 10,000 years or so. And that's being driven by the obliquity cycle. What's been happening here is the Earth's orbit has becoming more vertical. We're losing tilt. And over this 10,000 year period, we've lost about a half a degree of angular, angular tilt. And that has led to this slow cooling trend here. A couple of other features that are identifiable. This interruption of the warming is called the Younger Dryas. Dryas is a type of flower, which was common during this period. And um, this has to do with all the, the uh, ice melting uh, you know, in, in Greenland and North America. That fresh water having an impact on ocean circulation, that the, 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 Earth's, uh, the ocean's uh, thermohaline circulation, caused an interruption in the warming here. Uh, this is called the medieval warm period. Uh, this is a period of time when, uh, for example, the Vikings, uh, the Vikings colonized Greenland because the temperatures were favorable. This is called the Little Ice Age. This happened, uh, this happened in uh, between 1500 and 1700. And most famously, the River Thames froze over during this period. And then finally, 
And both these two events were driven by the sun, by the way. This thing about the sun thing. Well, the sun played a major role here, and the sun played a major role here. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And finally, we come to this. There's a red spot here. This is the post-industrial global warming. Now, here's... Yes? How do they figure out the temperatures? Yeah, great question. Great question. <laughs> um, only the red spike here are actually observed temperatures, directly observed temperatures by, by thermometers. And all of this information here is, is called proxy data. And so um, there's different types of proxy data come into play. Oftentimes, it has to do with isotopic analysis of various things. So for example, I mean, if you go back to your high school chemistry here, so hang in with me. You know, there's, there's oxygen. Oxygen has an atomic number of eight. And the most common isotope of oxygen is oxygen 16, which means there's eight protons and eight neutrons, so eight, eight, 16. But there are also trace amounts of oxygen 18, which has two additional neutrons in the nucleus. And chemically, they behave exactly the same, but oxygen 18 is a little bit heavier than oxygen 16. Also, there's hydrogen and deuterium. There's other uh, different isotopes as well. And it turns out there's this very strong correlation between those, uh, the ratio of those isotopes and the temperature. And the way that works is the warmer the Earth, the higher the, the ratio of oxygen 18 to 16 is, the colder the Earth, lower. Because it has to do with the temperature of the ocean and how readily the oxygen 18 um, evaporates in, in, in uh, water molecules. So we have these ice cores. We have these ice cores that go back you know, uh, about a million years. And you can uh, actually count the layers of the seasons and, and date the ice core. And of course, in the ice, you've got water. You've got water that was precipitated back you know, a million years ago, whatever. And from that water, you know, the chemist can do an isotopic analysis and get that ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 in those H2O molecules. And that allows you to, to do the temperature. Now, if you look at an individual reconstruction like that, it's going to be very noisy. But these curves here are based on a composite of, in the green case, 80 different reconstructions. In the blue case, 73 different reconstructions from sites all around the world. And that collapses down and gives you a pretty good um, handle and it really causes the um, uncertainty to become much smaller. And there are other things too. There's magnesium, different types, different isotopes of magnesium and various, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, deposits of limestone and, and brain and creatures and things like that. But basically all of this is a reconstructed temperature from those kinds of things. There are people that spend their whole life with that, you know, for sure. So what do we notice about this? Well, there's a couple things. Two, two important things. First of all, it's going in the wrong direction. Going in the wrong direction. The Earth should be cooling. We understand this process. The Earth is losing tilt, and it should be cooling. Indeed, it has been cooling the last 10,000 years. All of a sudden, there's this radical uptick. And when I say radical uptick, I do mean radical uptick, because the temperature here is warming about 20 times faster than normal climate change. Going in the wrong direction, going 20 times too fast. So what does 20 times too fast in the wrong direction mean? Well. Let's assume you are a golfer, and you're playing golf at Quail Lodge, and unfortunately, you take a wrong turn in your golf cart, and you end up westbound on Carmel Valley Road. <laughs> and unfortunately, it's car week. You suddenly encounter a Lamborghini coming the other way 200 miles an hour. Well, that's the difference. If, if natural climate change is happening at the speed and, and direction of, of a golf cart, this is like the Lamborghini, and going 200 miles an hour the other direction. Pretty hard to, to confuse the Lamborghini and the golf cart, and that's what we're talking about here. What we're seeing is absolutely not natural climate change. And this graph shows how it sticks out like a sword belt. Okay. I'm going to go through one more. Yes. I mean, I feel like of the, the little medieval um, warning period. Yes. And the little ice age. Right. It looks like it's just half a degree or less. Different. Yeah, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. Now, you have to realize that that's a half a degree in terms of, of, um, of the global mean temperature. It may have been warmer in, in certain areas. For example, uh, the Little Ice Age may have been cooler in Europe, and that's been reflected in this, in this um, figure. But it doesn't take much. And you realize, you know, big impact here, big impact where we are. You know? Right. Okay, I, I think we have time to go through one more, and then we'll take a break. And um, this is the one that's called, it's the sun. It's the sun causing it. So 
Well, the sun does affect climate. In fact, the sun was a major player in producing the minimum warm period as well as the little ice age. Now, how do we know that? You know, well, it turns out, again, through proxy data, proxy data, we're able to, um, to figure out solar activity. It's actually carbon-14 data. And again, it's a ratio of different isotopes of carbon-14 to carbon-12. That's a proxy for solar activity. And we know that the sun was, was burning particularly strong during this period. It's also a period of, of uh, increased sunspot activity. And also there was a period, that this was a period of, of not much uh, volcanic activity. And that's important because lower volcanic activity means less volcanic ash in the atmosphere. That warms the climate. We know that because through the sediment uh, analysis you can see you know, the record of the volcanic activity. The Little Ice Age was the opposite. There was a lot of volcanic activity during the Little Ice Age. And the, the Little Ice Age also corresponded to a period called the Mondra Minimum of, so, of sunspot activity, which means the sun was actually less, less strong. And that gave rise to this cooling here. And in fact, about 10% of the warming that occurred in the first half of the 20th century was a result of the sun. So if you're a opponent of the sun, you feel pretty good about that. That's the good news. But the bad news is um, that peak, that peaked. Um, Right about in the 60s. So what we're looking at here, the upper curve is uh, uh, the heavy red line is 11-year average of global mean surface temperature, and the thin curve is, is uh, yearly average. And what we're looking at in blue here is the solar irradiance. Now the heavy curve is 11-year average. 11 year makes sense because there is an 11-year sunspot cycle, and the sun does fluctuate on an 11-year period. You can see that right here. This is the sunspot cycle right here. When there's a lot of sunspots, the, nuclear, the uh, solar radius is, is large. When there's fewer sunspots, it goes down. It's only you know about a you know, fraction of a percent, but it's enough to make an impact. Well, let me back up. The sunspot cycle doesn't really affect climate because it happens too fast. But there are these longer-term trends that absolutely do affect climate. You know, I just told you that you know, the medieval long period and the, and the little ice age were affected by that. So these longer-term trends in solar radius absolutely can affect climate. And in fact, during the first half of the 20th century, about 10% of the warming was not due to CO2, it was due to the sun. The problem is, it peaked here in the 60s and started going down at a time when this, the temperature really took off. So this alone is enough to tell you it's not the sun. But I've got two more um, nails to pan in that coffin. And the first one is um, this argument right here. If, if, if sort of warming was due to increasing solar irradiance, then the whole atmosphere would be warming because the sun warms the atmosphere from top to bottom. And it particularly warms the atmosphere um, in the lower stratosphere. That's where the ozone layer is, and that's where most of the sun, solar radiation is absorbed. If you were turning up the reset on the sun, the atmosphere would warm, would warm top to bottom. It would be particularly evident in the lower stratosphere. But in fact, that's not what we see. What we're looking at here is temperature um, in the, uh, this is global lower stratospheric anomalies, temperature anomalies, from 58 to 2012, and in some cases uh, it's from uh, satellite, well, these, the, the blue and the red are from satellite data, and the black is from um, uh, weather balloon data. And what you see is there is this downward trend. The lower stratosphere is cooling, whereas the, the uh, lower troposphere is warming. Now, that's something I should tell you. The greenhouse effect that behaves as follows. It causes the lower troposphere the lowest layer of the atmosphere to warm. Now, what do I mean by lower troposphere? Surface to about 20,000 feet. The troposphere is the lowest layer. It goes from the surface to about the le level where you fly in a jet airliner. Only the lower half of that is warming. Everywhere above the lower half is cooling due to global warming. Why is that? It's because the heat that would normally warm that upper atmosphere is being trapped below. Being trapped below. So here, you see that effect. It's cooling. This is indicative of the greenhouse effect. The heat that would normally warm this area up here is being trapped below, and indeed the lower troposphere is warming. If it was the sun, then this would be warming the lower atmosphere, and the upper atmosphere would be warming too. So it, that's another indicator that's not the sun. And finally, um, the sun dominates the Earth's radiation balance during the day, while the greenhouse effect dominates at night. During the day, the sun's there, at night it's not there. So if the observed global warming was doing due to increasing solar activity, then days would be warming faster than nights. 
if due to the greenhouse effect, the nights would be warming faster than days. If either was important, they'd probably be warming about the same rate. Well, when you go back and look at the data, it's very clear that, in fact, nights have been warming about twice as fast as days over the last hundred years. Again, that's indicative of the warming is not due to increasing solar radius. In fact, it's due to the greenhouse effect. Yes, sir? Why? Why? Well, it, 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 during the daytime, the sun is, is, is not affecting. Or during the daytime, the sun is dominating. In the nighttime, the sun is not there. So the so daytime, the sun is dominating. Nighttime, greenhouse effect is dominating. Okay. And so we see that the nighttime temperatures are increasing faster. That just says it's got to be what's happening at night. That's the greenhouse effect. Daytime is the sun. And um, you know, if the sun was dominating, then the, sun, then the daytime would be increasing faster. If they both increase at the same rate, and you'd say, well, it's something else going on, neither, neither. But in fact, very clearly, um, the nighttime temperatures are increasing faster than daytime temperatures. OK, I, I make a really good time here. I'm really happy with that. We're going to have time to answer some questions. Okay, let's take a 10-minute break. Thanks. OK. We're going to jump back in and keep going, going down my list of climate change and on this. And the next one is the CO2, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is just too low in classical. How could it ever do anything? And indeed it is quite low. Uh, I mentioned 400 parts per million. Well, that translates into 0.04%. 0.04% is really low. So the blue here on this pie chart represents all the air molecules. That's nitrogen, oxygen, and the other constituents of air. And this little thin red line here is the CO2. It's really low. It's 0.04%. You know, let's see it, right? In fact, there's a lot of climate denial videos out there on YouTube. There's this one really weird guy from New Zealand is out there, and he's got a big pile yeah. of beans. They're black, and his pile of beans are white. You know, very few. And look, how could this possibly be causing global warming? You know, it's so little. And indeed, it is quite little. Well, here's the thing. The impact of any chemical substance for bringing about change in a physical, chemical, or biological system generally depends on two factors. One is the concentration of the substance, but the other is the potency of the substance. That's the word they don't include, potency. For example, now I know this would never happen to anyone in this room, but suppose you had a friend who had a little bit too much to drink at a party, and he goes out and drives, a little bit of trouble keeping that car on the road, and the uh, you know, highway patrol pulls him over, and they do the breathalyzer, breathalyzer, and conclude that his blood alcohol concentration is 0.1%. Well, this is what that would look like. The blue is our, you know, all the other molecules in your blood, and here's the, here's the alcohol in your blood. Now, your friend could try the following argument. He could say, you know, officer, this concentration is really low. It's it's about the same as the CO2 in the atmosphere. It can't be having an <laughs> So you can see how well that might work. Now another more extreme example is there is a material called VX. And VX is a neurotoxin. It's an organophosphate poison. It's uh, one of the most potent poisons in the world. It's a principal component of many uh, chemical weapons, or at least it used to be. It may be banned now. If you were so unfortunate as to have a pinhead drop of the land on your skin. You barely see it. You probably need a magnifying glass to see it. It would absorb through your skin, and the concentration in your bloodstream would be about 0.0002%, which is about 200 times less than the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere. It would kill you in a matter of minutes. Potency, you know, potency is what comes into play here. The fact of the matter is, CO2 is a very potent greenhouse gas, and it can and does have a big impact at 0.04%, just as these examples show you that, you know, potent chemicals can have a big impact at low concentration. Okay, finally they throw up their hands and say, okay, it's caused by CO2, you got me beaten down on that fact, but it's not coming from, from fossil fuels, it's not coming from driving my car, drill baby drill, it's coming from someplace else, like volcanoes or the ocean. And in fact, volcanoes do emit CO2 when they erupt, but not very much. You know, a typical volcano, volcanic eruption uh, results in about 1% of global annual emissions. And you can see it here. This is the healing curve we looked at before from Mauna Loa. Very careful observations here. And here are three major volcanic eruptions. 
Agong, El Chacon in Mexico, Pinatubo in the Philippines. This curve here is a measure of the volcanic ash in the atmosphere. And you can see there's just no signature on it. It's just, it's just too small. It's not having any impact. And in fact, if it, was, if it was volcanoes, the way it would work is the CO2 would be steady until you had a volcanic eruption. Then it would jump up. Then it would be steady until you had another one. It would jump up. Mm. Steady until another one would jump up. Well, it doesn't go like that. Yeah. Volcanoes are having no impact on CO2 in the atmosphere. No significant impact. They're negative. Well, the next one is um, the ocean. The oceans are warming, and generally speaking, as they warm, you'd expect maybe that's going to cause the CO2 to be given out. Again, here's the Keeling curve here, this is the CO2, and now it's being depicted with the uh, uh, seasonal cycle. Well, the blue curve here is a concentration of CO2 in the ocean over a um, pretty long period here. This is taken off of Hawaii long record there, and what you see is the concentration of CO2 is going up. And in fact, as the concentration of CO2 is going up in the ocean, the, the uh, pH of the ocean is going down. Now, the ocean is still on the basic side of the neutral. Think back to your high school chemistry. There's that pH scale from 1 to 14. 7 is neutral. And uh, the numbers larger than 7 are on the basic side, lower than 7 is on the acidic side. The ocean is still on the, on the basic side of neutral, but it's trending more towards the acidic side. It's called ocean acidification. Uh, ocean acidification is sometimes referred to as the evil twin of global warming. And it has a big negative impact on, uh, on shellfish, particularly, um, particularly it, it, you're, um, you know, has, they have a hard time reproducing and forming their shells. So it's not due to, it's not due to that. CO2 is actually going up, not down in the ocean. And there's one final thing, and that is, now this gets a little bit complicated here, don't worry about this too much, but there's a parameter called delta 13C, and it measures the ratio of, of uh, carbon 13 to carbon 12. Again, we're talking about these isotopes of carbon, you know. And then the idea here is carbon 12 is the most common, but there's, there's carbon 13, which has one additional neutron in the, uh, in the nucleus. And it turns out that um, fossil fuels when they burn and, and emit CO2, the carbon, they're, they're depleted in, in carbon-13. That's because when they formed millions and millions, of, hundreds of millions of years ago, there was less carbon-13 in the atmosphere. So you can prove this in the laboratory. Just take the fossil, and you're possibly of your choice, burn it, collect it, the CO2, measure it, and the chemists can do that very, very carefully. And here's a measurement of this delta-13 parameter uh, taken off Tasmania, and it's been going down. And without going through the math here, I can tell you that as it goes down, that means uh, there's the, the atmosphere is becoming more and more depleted in carbon-13. And that is like a DNA fingerprint of where the CO2 is coming from. It's coming from the burning of fossil fuels. If that wasn't the case, you wouldn't get this decline of this delta-13C parameter. A little bit geeky here, but think of it as being like a DNA fingerprint. It's a DNA fingerprint of the CO2 in the atmosphere. This proves conclusively that it is coming from, mainly from burning of fossil fuels, mainly from. Yes, ma'am. Why isn't there any talk about the increasing human population and we breathe out CO2? Yes. It was, good. That would have a contribution to that. It does. It does. And I actually calculated that one time for the you know, population. And it's pretty low. You know, we're, we're putting about 40 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, into the atmosphere every year. And, um, you know, I can't remember the, the exact number, but I did calculate it, and it was something like a, less than a billion tons. So it's comparable to fossil fuels. It's it's small. It's pretty negligible compared to fossil fuels. Yes, but that's a good question. I, I wish I could remember that number exactly, but it's pretty low. Okay. Oh no, this is where it really gets heavy. <laughs> Hang in there. Take a deep breath. This is, kind of deep. this is my favorite part. And this is where I get really, really, really geeky. Yeah. Hang in there. You'll like it, you'll like it. <laughs> so, they can't predict the weather 10 days from now. Surely they can't predict the climate 100 years from now. Well, actually you can. And it comes back to this, this slide. The difference between weather, climate variability, and climate change. And we've already explored this part. But there's two other issues here, and that is weather is an initial value problem, whereas climate is an externally forced problem. And that's really getting mathematically geeky here. So what do I mean by that? Well, this is the weather value. This is the initial problem. The initial value problem. This is the weather problem. And weather is chaotic. 
and a key aspect and key aspects of other prediction are described by chaos theory, which you probably heard about. In fact, the meteorologists invented chaos theory when they were studying weather. And so, accordingly, weather prediction is an initial value problem such that small discrepancies between a weather prediction model's initial state and the actual atmosphere produce rapidly growing errors in the model forecast. You've probably heard that parable about the flap of the butterfly's wing in Africa can lead to a hurricane that hits Miami two weeks later. I don't know if that's ever happened, <laughs> but, but that's the general idea. Very small perturbations that you have no, no capability of, of modeling. You don't have a big enough computer model. Even if you had a big enough computer model and a big enough computer, you couldn't observe every butterfly in the world out there. So that limits the, the, the forecast, your ability to forecast the weather. And it goes like this. And you start out with these little, very minor discrepancies, barely notice them. The red is the actual atmosphere. The blue are two different weather forecast models, or, or the, the same run of the same, or two different runs of the same weather forecast model, slightly different initial state. Initially, they track along here pretty good, out to about maybe a week or so, and then they start to diverge. And the difference between the blue line and the red line is the error. You can think of this being the temperature in Monterey, and the blue line is the model forecast for the temperature in Monterey. And pretty quickly, they diverge widely and become completely irrelevant. That's how the weather problem works. But climate is not weather, and climate prediction is not weather prediction. Climate models are not weather models. Climate is a long-term, which means about 30-year average of weather. And this long-term averaging filters out the chaotic behavior of weather. It makes climate prediction an externally forced problem. Relatively insensitive to the initial state and driven by the cumulative effect of external forcing on the climate system. So if you can make accurate assumptions of this external forcing, then you can predict the climate actually 100 years into the future with no problem. So what are these external forcing factors? That's what we need to know. Well, oh, before I get to that, here's another analogy between weather and climate. Uh, imagine you're, you've got water here and the bowl and you're on the stove, and you're bringing it to a boil. The weather prediction model or problem is analogous to trying to predict the location of every bubble here over time. You know, as the water comes to a boil, you're going to predict the location of every bubble here over time. That's what weather prediction is like. You can think of each bubble here as being like an individual weather, weather uh, uh, phenomenon. Trying to predict the average temperature of the water in the bowl is the climate prediction problem. You can think of the bowl as being like the world, and you know, the average temperature of the water here is the average temperature of the earth, and the bubbles here are the water. You can have the biggest supercomputer in the world, the best model, and it would be very difficult to be able to predict the location of every, every bubble there over any period of time. Pretty quickly, it would diverge from your model forecast would diverge from reality. But it's pretty simple to predict the rate in which the water is warming up. You can do that with a hand calculator. And all you need to know is how, how much heat's coming from here, how much water is in there. Easy calculation. So that's kind of the, the, the comparison of weather prediction to climate prediction. Weather prediction is much more difficult. So what are those external forcing factors that drive climate? Well, we're back to this figure again, which is the global mean um, energy balance. And um, first thing you need to know is this really is it. The other sources of heat here are negligible. For example, heat from the Earth's interior. I mean, we know that there's heat coming up from the Earth's interior. That's how geothermal energy works. So why is that on the speaker? It's because it's really small. It's about 4,000 times smaller than the incoming solar radiation. What about waste heat from buildings? Air conditioning and heating and all that. Well, that's about uh, 11,000 times smaller than the incoming solar radiation. But about frictional heating from the tidal circulation. Tides are running around here all the time. That friction is, <coughs> frictional heating is happening. Well, that's about uh, 50,000 times smaller than the incoming solar radiation. So what really dominates is what's on this chart right here. So that being the case, we can then pretty quickly conclude that <coughs> whether the Earth warms up or cools down is really a result of this net balance of energy uh, radiation at the top of the atmosphere. Think about it. There's a ball hanging out in space. And whether it's going to warm up or cool down is really driven by what's the balance here. Is there more energy coming in? Is there more energy going out? Or it's in balance. If it's in balance, it's going to stay the same. If there's more energy coming in from the sun, it's going to warm up. 
if there's less energy coming in from the sun, there's more going out, it's going to cool down. And that works because the internal sources of heat here I just talked about are just negligible. We don't have to worry about those. So that being the case, then we can go back to this um, figure and realize that this energy balance here really is given by these numbers right here. Now this is the incoming solar radiation right here, and here's the, the two outgoing right there. And in fact, if you sum those numbers together, you get this number down here, which is the, the net warming of the Earth. All this is just kind of details. What really counts is the net warming of the Earth right here, and that's just the sum of these numbers up here. So the question then becomes, what controls these numbers up here? Those are the external forcing factors. And it turns out, um, for... Um, for time scales of a few thousand years, centuries to a few thousand years, which is the time scale we're concerned about for global warming, um, there are three and only three factors that force this. These are the three key factors. The first is the incoming solar radiation. Sun fluctuates, we talked about earlier, and that can definitely change the climate. The second is the amount of aerosols in the atmosphere, because they reflect solar radiation out. And then the third, are the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Why do I not talk about clouds here? Well, because clouds are internal to the atmosphere. I'm talking about external factors to the atmosphere. So there are three and only three forcing functions. The sun, the amount of aerosols in the atmosphere, and the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So if you can make assumptions about these three forcing functions, then you can, you can uh, make a forecast that's going to be accurate. Now, on time scales of hundreds of thousands of years, those Milankovitch cycles we talked about earlier, the variations in the Earth's orbit, they come into play. But we're not talking about that now. We're talking about you know, time scales of centuries to a couple thousand years. So we're not worrying about that. On time scales of hundreds of millions of years, the continents move around. Continental drift, the continents move around. That changes the ocean circulation and it has a big impact on climate, but we're not talking about that. And finally, on time scales of billions of years, um, it's likely there'll be a catastrophic collision with an extraterrestrial object, which has happened a couple of times in the past. And of course, that would have a huge impact on the climate. But we're not talking about that. We're only talking about things that are happening, you know, hundreds of, on the time scale of centuries to a couple of thousand years. <coughs> so, what is a climate model? What does a climate model look like? Well, a climate model is just a big computer program, very complex. We would typically have about a million lines of code. It would have many different components. Uh, it would be laid out over um, the, the Earth on a, on a grid, a spherical grid that looks like this. It would encompass the ocean, the atmosphere, the cryosphere, the, uh, the biosphere. The cryosphere is the ice areas of the world. And um, all these components would talk to each other. And all these components would be based on the fundamental basic uh, science, basic um, equations that describe uh, the atmosphere, the ocean, lies here. So what's the best climate model? Well, there is no single best climate model. Why is that true? Well, these models are all based on the same basic science, but there is considerable leeway in how they're implemented on this grid, and there's, there's also um, considerable leeway on how you represent things that happen at scales smaller than the grid. And as a result, different models give different answers. So there's no single model that's found to be clearly the best. Uh, so, accordingly, the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, uses about 30 to 40 different models. They use an ensemble, which is just a fancy way of name, way of saying a collection of 30 or 40 models that have been carefully tested and accredited. These models were developed in about a dozen different countries. And um, the advantage of running an ensemble of models is not only do you get an answer, but you get a range of answers. And that gives you some, some feeling on the uncertainty. You get some air bars, plus or minus. And that's the approach that's been taken. So how can you tell if a model's any good or not? Well, there's something called hind casting. And that is you go back in the past and try to forecast up to the present. So we know, for example, we know we have the record of how the climate has changed over the last 120 years. So let's go back 120 years, say and pretend we're starting there and see if we can predict to the current time. Because we know the answer already. See if we can predict the first principles to the current time and see how good the models do. And that's the basic idea here. And here's an example of, of that being done. So the red curve here is the observed climate, global mean surface temperature of the Earth. And the gray um, shaded area is uh, the envelope of the 
IPCC climate model hindcast. So the upper edge of the gray here would be the warmest prediction. Might be from one model at one point, might be from another model at another point. And the lowest part here is the coldest prediction from one model or another. And what you see is, all the way back here from um, you know, the 1800s, 140 year forecast, the models do pretty good in tracking this forecast. I mean, think about it. The models might have just gone straight across here and not recognize this warming. They might have warmed here and cooled here. They might go up when the, the, when the observed temperature was going down and vice versa. But in fact, they track along pretty well. And they do capture this warming such that after 140 years of forecasting, uh, they come within about a tenth of a degree, which is pretty darn good, predicting the global and so the temperature of the Earth. So that gives us confidence if we can predict you know, a pretty good re um, uh, representation of a 140 year period. We have confidence that going forward, the models can give us a good forecast. Yes, what happened in 1960? Because you used that for several of your film models that showed the spiking stock starting in 1960. Well, actually, uh, 1970. 1975 mm -hmm. uh, is when I believe took off and went up. Yeah, there was a period of time where things were cooling. And, um, I see, I see if I can show it here. Um, yeah, it was this, this period of time here when things were cooling. And that um, started sort of from the mid 40s and extended to about, uh, I guess, the mid 60s or something, or into the 70s. And that was caused by um, a rapid, significant increase in uh, air pollution around the world. That was the post World War II period. And that was before um, a lot of regulations were put in place to control air pollution, even with the days of acid rain and all that. And all those, that pollution globally reflected the sunlight and caused the earth to cool. As we, uh, that caused an interruption in global warming. As uh, in the, I guess in the 70s and certainly in the 80s, as uh, policy were put in place to control you know, those particular those pollution, pollutants in the atmosphere. Um, I mean, accelerated again. So that's what's going on there. So generally speaking, yeah, we, we can have confidence in these models. They do a pretty good job. And they, and they give you a range of, of outcomes, not a single outcome. And here's an example of that. Um, these, so you have to make assumptions about the, um, the um, forcing functions. And the, the forcing function that's most important is the emissions of CO2. So here are two different um, predicted warmings global average surface temperature change relative to this period for two different emission scenarios. This one called RCP 8.5 is kind of business as usual. You know, we're not going to constrain. We're just going to forget about it. You know, we'll keep going what we're doing. And this is the most stringent constraint on, on CO2 emissions. And what these models do is they tell you, they give you an order of magnitude. They give you a feel for, you know, if, if, we, if we just don't do anything, we're going to be in this range here. And, um, and there's some uncertainty. But if we do follow the, the um, recommendations of the Paris Accord and, and really try to get CO2 under control, the, rec the basic recommendation of the Paris Accord is try to hold uh, global warming to 1.5 degrees C by the end of this century. And that requires uh, carbon, achieving carbon neutrality by 2050, which means we need to reduce carbon emissions by a factor of about two by 2050. And these models can give you guidance on what the impacts of that would be. The lower curve here is sea level rise, and you can see from business as usual, we're talking about close to, potentially close to a meter of sea level rise, and here it's quite a bit less. Generally speaking, and this is all coming from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which I consider to be the single authoritative voice on these matters. Generally speaking, they have been rather conservative. When you go back and look at the history of what they predicted, they'll come along, you know, four or five years later, and update their reports. What they're going to typically say is, well, we underestimated how the warming is actually warming faster. We underestimated sea level rise is actually rising faster. Typically, the sea level rise in particular has been underestimated. If you go back and look at what's actually happened, the observed sea level has kind of tracked along the upper bound of their, of their uncertainty range here. And um, as we get to understand more and more about the ice sheets, which are a major contributor to sea level rise, it's starting to trend up and up higher and higher in terms of what, what people's expectations are. <coughs> Okay. okay, here's a good myth. Data coverage is insufficient to observe climate change. You know, it's just a big complicated atmosphere out there. How can we observe this, you know? 
you gotta put your hands up, you can't do it. Well, come back to this, this chart again. The uh, couple observations that are out there of the, of the ocean and the atmosphere are really geared towards the weather prediction problem, not so much the climate prediction problem. And as a result, the climate prediction problem is actually well oversampled. It's oversampled because to support the weather prediction problem, because it's the time scales and space scales are much smaller, you need a lot more observations out there to observe weather than you do to observe climate. And as a result, we have the happy circumstance that the climate problem is actually well observed. It's over observed compared to the weather problem. And there's a there's an armada of satellites out there. You know, these are all real satellites that are that are they're flying. And uh, most of them are supporting the weather prediction problem. Some are, are specifically for the climate problem. And they're observing the atmosphere, the ocean, the land, the cryosphere. And uh, there's just a huge amount of data out there. And as a result, we can absolutely observe the climate. And in fact, remember one of the first slides I showed you with the five different lines that kind of collapsed? That's because there's so much data out there. And we actually can observe very well. Here's an example of, uh, this is, um, uh, a microwave sounding product. It's actually measuring, you know, temperature in the atmosphere and rain and so forth. And this is just uh, a one-day composite of data from this one sounding unit on a couple of satellites. And you can see it depicts the weather quite well. There's a hurricane right here and the front right there. Here's the tropical convergence on all these clouds. So the uh, climate system is well observed. It's in fact over observed. No problem. Oh, I'm coming to the end. <laughs> We're going to have lots of time for discussion. Okay. Actually, you're working down through all these things. Finally, they throw up their hands. Okay, it's changing. Humans are doing it. And they finally beat me down on this. But it's a good thing. So, you know, drill, baby, drill, buy a new SUV. It's a good thing. Because, you know, it's going to get warmer. And and uh, we're going to be able to grow crops in the Arctic. And we're going to have ice free Arctic for commerce up there. And it's going to be really good. Well... Uh, not really. Um, here's where we are right now. And here's where we're going. If we meet the full recommendations of the Paris Accord, and we're not, quite frankly, we're not on track. The um, UN just issued a report uh, a few months ago, kind of report card on where the world is with regard to meeting the, the requirements of the Paris Accord. And nobody's meeting. Of course, the United States pulled out. We're setting a very bad example there. And the rest of the world is not doing so good. So we're not going to get there. That's where we'd like to be. And look where it is. And if we don't do anything, if the rest of the world follows the recommendation, or follows the example of the United States, and pulls out of the accord and just says business as usual, then this is where we're going. And that's pretty dramatic. You know, it's comparable to the difference between a warm period and an ice age. And uh, this is not going to be a good thing. <laughs> And why? Well, because human civilization began right here. And the climate has varied through a very small, narrow range over the course of human civilization. And now suddenly we're going to go way up there. And the problem is, is human civilization going to be able to adapt quickly enough? And the answer very likely is no. For example, um, sea level rise. Uh, a one meter rise in sea level will displace about 100 million people globally. 30 million in Bangladesh alone. And they got no place to go, because India is not going to take them, and neither is, neither is Myanmar. Two meter wise will displace about 200 million people globally, most of them in Asia, most of them in very poor countries. But that leads to instability. Where are those people going to go? How are they going to live? This kind of rapidly changing climate creates huge competition for the very fundamental basics of life. And that's Food, water, and living space. Food, water, and living space globally are going to be under attack here. Now, we live in a very rich country, and it's pretty easy for us to adapt to it, but the rest of the country, not so much. And even in our country, over you know long periods of time, the major cities like Miami, New Orleans, New York, San Francisco are going to be challenged now by, by rising sea levels. And I want to play, play a quick video for you. This is a very nice... Uh, Summary done by the BBC talking about uh, the uh, climate impacts in 2019. What do we know about the impact of climate change on the world's weather this year? Let's start in the Arctic. Summer 2019 has seen Arctic ice 30% below normal. 
This region is heating up about twice the average of the rest of the world and is caught in what scientists call a positive feedback loop. That's where sea ice thins and melts, opening up vast expanses of dark ocean that absorbs more heat from the sun, causing further warming. This dramatic warming of the Arctic may affect the strength and position of the jet stream, which brings the weather to the likes of North America and Europe. Globally, July 2019 was the hottest month ever recorded, and the Northern Hemisphere had the hottest summer on record. France and the UK were just two of the many European countries to see their temperature record broken. Studies showed the heat wave in France was made at least five times more likely by climate change. July was also Alaska's hottest month in recorded history. Wildfires there and elsewhere in the Arctic Circle are estimated to have released 50 megatons of CO2 in just one month, the equivalent of Sweden's annual carbon output. Wildfires hit the UK too, but in February, temperatures reached over 20 Celsius for the first time ever in winter. And on the other side of the world, Australia saw its hottest January on record, prompting health warnings and total fire bans. But by the laws of physics, a warmer world could hold more water vapour and potentially lead to more severe rainfall events. While the link between climate change and the Indian monsoon is uncertain, Mumbai has seen record summer monsoon rainfall totals. Iran suffered devastating floods in the spring of this year, as exceptional rainfall followed a prolonged period of drought. In Africa, Cyclone Edai was described by the UN as one of the worst natural disasters ever to hit the southern hemisphere. Heavy rain and coastal flooding led to the deaths of more than 700 people. Storms like these are expected to become stronger in a warming world. And in September, Hurricane Dorian became the second most powerful Atlantic hurricane in recorded history. Gusts of 220 miles per hour were measured in the Bahamas. An estimated 35 inches of rain fell together with a huge storm surge. Sea level rise is already threatening other island communities, such as the Maldives. The Paris Agreement aims to pursue efforts to limit the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But even under that scenario, sea level could rise by up to 77 centimetres by the end of this century. So 2019 has seen many examples of extreme weather that scientists predict could become the new norm in a warming world. So. Does it sound like a good thing to me? No. And now, another video. <laughs> another video. Um, which gets a little bit closer to home. The 2018 wildfire season was the deadliest and most destructive ever recorded in California, according to the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. Across the West, fires are starting sooner in the year, lasting longer, and getting bigger. And if they seem to be trending more apocalyptic, they are. Fires start with three things, fuel, oxygen, and heat. When temperatures are high, precipitation and humidity low, and winds are swirling, it's prime time for fires. Add in a spark, be it natural like lightning or man-made like a downed power line, a discarded cigarette, or a campfire, then bam, you've got yourself a fire. And with high winds, a low Santa Ana's, and lots of fuel, the fire can become a rager. Fires have been increasing in numbers and intensity out west for three big reasons. First, the western U.S. has been getting warmer and drier due to climate change, making it prime territory for fires to start and spread. Since 1970, temperatures in forested parts of the west have gone up about 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit, and they're expected to keep rising. Snow melts and spring thaws are happening earlier in the year, too. The result? Forests and vegetation are getting drier. Because of warmer weather and the resulting aridity out west, from 1984 to 2015, fires spread an additional 16,000 square miles than they otherwise would have. That's the size of Massachusetts and Connecticut combined. Second, suburbanization into wildland areas has increased the risk of man-made fires and put more homes directly in the line of fire. Third, long-standing fire suppression policies lasting up into the 1970s have made a lot of land out west very flammable. Fires clear out overgrowth and dead foliage and foster the growth of trees that are more capable of resisting fires. While the government has since shifted away from those suppression policies, decades of accumulated dead branches and brush have become fuel for more catastrophic fire. So, does it sound like anything for us, does it? Well, quickly we're going to run through uh, the natural consequences of a global warming world.
<coughs> so um, increasing temperature of the land, ocean, and lower troposphere. Remember, we learned it's only the lower part of the atmosphere that's forming. It's cooling above. Decreasing temperature of the upper atmosphere and above. That's what caused this more severe weather. You're making the atmosphere more unstable. Heating from below, cooling from above. That makes it more unstable, which is increasing frequency and intensity of severe storms. Increasing frequency of life-threatening heat waves. It turns out heat waves kill more people than any other weather phenomenon globally. More people die of heat waves than anything else. More than hurricanes, more than tornadoes. Increasing absolute humidity, which is the water content of the air, which yields increasing frequency and intensity of floods in wet regions. Hello, Houston. Decreasing relative humidity, which is the likelihood of precipitation. Hello, Monterey, which means less likely to get rain. Decreasing snowfall relative to rainfall, that's a problem for the Sierras. And we get a lot of get about one third of our drinking water in California from snowpack in the Sierras. But there will be less precipitation falling as snow more as water tends to run off and doesn't build the snowpack. Um, decreasing snowpacks, which means increasing frequency of droughts and wildfires in dry regions. Sea level rise due to melting of ice sheets and glaciers, warming of the ocean. Ocean acidification we talked about. There's also decreasing oxygen levels in the ocean, which is hurting the the fish. Um, increasing mortality of coral reefs, coral bleaching, and uh, decreasing productivity of fisheries, including the fisheries off the coast of California. Increasing species migrations and extinctions. I think, uh, I'm not sure if I'll get the number right, I think it was, I think it was 8%, 8 of um, existing species right now are, are a threat of extinction of climate change. That's pretty huge, 8%. So those are the natural consequences. The human consequences, not a pretty picture. Increasing economic costs. Uh, increasing competition among nations from water and food, and also living space, caused by drought and agricultural and fisheries production, <coughs> reductions, rising sea levels. Increasing displacements of people and rusted populations in unstable parts of the world. And these risks are unevenly distributed between groups of people and between regions. Risks are generally greater for disadvantaged people living in developing countries. <laughs> Mike, on the, the one graphic you showed of the satellites I saw of Russia and China listed, how much cooperation is, is there in the world between all the countries in gathering data? There is. There's a lot. There's a lot of cooperation there. Um, there's something called the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, it comes under the under the UN, and uh, it's been around for a long time. And uh, essentially, that organization facilitates the exchange of weather data. There's a there's a global network of exchanging information like that. So there's pretty good cooperation. There. Yes, sir. Um, you didn't mention methane. Is that a sig first of all? I think it's more powerful, but it's shorter shorter lived. That's true. What is the impact on the models for because the melting ice is going to expose the tundra, which has a huge amount of methane? Yes. So anyway, gentleman knows a lot about this topic, right there. Excellent. Uh, yeah, methane right now is about 20. Is, at this point in time, is producing about 20 percent of the global warming compared to 72 percent for uh, CO2. But as the gentleman points out, methane is actually a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. In fact, it's about 280 times more potent. But it has less of a life cycle. Uh, CO2 you put in the atmosphere, the nominal lifetime is about 100 years. Um, methane nominal lifetime is about 10 years. So you divide, you divide those numbers out, and you, you find that methane has a global warming potential over the next 100 years of about 28 times that of CO2. So what that means is, if you put um, a billion tons of methane into the atmosphere, it's the same as putting 28 billion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. So methane is a real concern. And as the gentleman correctly points out, a very big concern is the fact that there's a huge amount of methane trapped in the permafrost in the higher latitudes in Canada and in, in, in Russia. And at some point, there's concern that when the Earth warms enough, that, met, that um, permafrost will melt and that methane will be released. And that could, cause, that could be a very significant inflection point. Lots of times people want to use the word tipping point. I'm not shy away from that. I'm going to call it a deflection point, such that the warming would increase dramatically with the release of that methane. That is a real concern. And um, we don't know for sure what level of warming it would take to get to that point, but it's probably in the range of about 5 degrees centigrade. It's potentially where we can get to by the end of the century. Yes, sir. Has there been any practical method developed that can capture that 
those gases because they can be used uh, for yeah. heating and yeah, but there, there are companies out there that are developing uh, devices that, you know, capture CO2. Whether they will ever be scalable to the point of having an impact on this problem, I don't know. But there are lots of things that can be done. And I'm going to refer you to a website called drawdown.org. Drawdown.org. It's also a name of a bestseller book called Drawdown. It was a New York Times bestseller. But the drawdown or, or drawdown.org is really, really excellent. And um, it's an organization that was formed by, uh, I think, uh, formed about five or ten years ago. And um, they're for real. They've got a lot of science power behind it, a lot of engineering talent, a lot of, a lot of uh, economic, economists behind them. And what they've done is they've identified 80 solutions to this problem. Pretty much has produced a roadmap for the world's governments to pursue this. And they've actually ranked them number one through 80 in terms of how much greenhouse gas they could pull out of the atmosphere. And they've priced it out over the next 30 year period. They're, they're recommending that you know these solutions be implemented between now and 2050. And if they were implemented at the level that Drawdown recommends, they would basically meet the, the uh, goals of the, of the Paris Accord. They would reduce emissions by about a factor of two. And a big part of that is um, is things like reforestation, where you're restoring forests that have been that have been plowed under for, for farming, or you know, for growing um, palm oil and things like that. And afforestation, growing forests where there are no forests before. Forests are really good at you know, they, 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 they uh, sequester the CO2 out of the atmosphere, that kind of thing. So there's eight, there's 80 solutions there, uh, going to green energy, you know, wind power, solar. Rooftop solar, all those kinds of things. Trying to keep world population growth down is a big part of it. You know, every person, every soul that comes in, in, into into the world brings a carbon footprint with them, and that's a big part of the answer. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, don't, I always thought the insurance industry would be in, interested in this dynamic of yeah. their mm -hmm. long-term financial or whatever yeah. it is their risk and so on. But yeah. yeah, that's a great question. I don't know why. You're right. Or, uh, I'm unclear on, on why that's the case. Um, you know, if you live in Florida, you know, you're going to pay a lot of money for your insurance. <laughs> After uh, Hurricane Andrew, all the insurance rates went way up there. And so uh, that's uh, certainly they're keyed into it. I'm sure there, there are people that work for insurance companies that worry about the trends and you know, hurricanes and things like that. Other questions? Yes? yes if there was one place, so the naysayers out there, if there was one place I could point someone to, I was having a conversation with who doesn't believe in climate change, mm -hmm. is there somewhere I can point them to where I know I can say, okay, go to this website or go here yes. and read this? I, I, have, I have a recommendation on that. It's called okay. skeptic, skepticalscience.com. Okay. Skeptical science. I think that's the one. It, 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 you don't find it there, just Google skeptical science. I think it's skepticalscience.com. And... Um, they, it's really good, and they, they have like a hundred or hundred plus uh, climate denial myths, which you can click on and go right down the list. And the nice thing about it is they have um, like basic, intermediate, and advanced uh, discussions. So if you really want to get science, you can go to the advanced. Just the basic one is, is, is pretty advanced, but you know that's a really good one. That really kind of addresses a lot of the climate denial stuff. Yes. Another question: Are there countries that you can identify that are probably doing well, going in this direction, going in the right direction, doing the cross section of? Yeah. yeah, the Scandinavian countries are doing pretty well. They seem to be pretty, uh, pretty uh, progressive with regard to this. You know, and the UK is doing pretty well. You know, there are, there are various uh, read every now and I'll read us. There'll be a, you know a, a city in Scandinavia or the UK that's they've they, they achieved carbon neutrality and that kind of thing. So they're doing pretty well. Um, beyond the record in the United States is not so good. Record in California is pretty good though, actually. Um, I'll throw this number out. The um, average carbon foot, the uh, per capita carbon footprint for Americans is 17 tons per year. So the average American puts out 17 tons of, of, of CO2 in the atmosphere every year. California is only 11. We're down to 11 tons per year. So that's, that's a pretty good story. Um, 
I'd like to be able to say it's because we're so we're so smart and progressive and all that, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that we have mild weather and yeah. we don't have any smoke stack industry and things like that. Another number I like to throw out is California produces um, California produces three percent of global GDP, but only one percent of global emissions. So in that sense, we're again pretty good story. Questions? Okay. Um, you say that consciousness is increasing about this. And yes. Obviously, you know, I think where we need to get the traction is in the political arena to yep. get the United States on board. Yes. So do you do you have any suggestions about that? I mean, as an individual, I want to do things. I've yes. done a lot of things at my house, but yeah. it has to be bigger than that. And yeah. Just let me, I'm glad you raised that question. I just want to put in a plug for our Congressman Jay Panetta. You may or may not know, uh, Congressman Panetta has introduced something called the CAR Act, the Climate Action and Rebate Act. One of only four uh, carbon pricing bills that are going forward in Congress. So the way I'd like to say about it, there's 435 members of Congress, only less than 1% have introduced these bills, and our guy is one of them. It's, in my opinion, it's the best one. It's very aggressive, and it's really good. But um, the big problem is there's the, is, you know, well, problems we all know about. There's a lot of money in politics. Yeah. There's a lot of lobbyists. And there's a lot of money behind the fossil fuel industry. There's a lot of interest out there. They're heavily invested in the fossil fuel industry. Foundations, names like Koch Foundation and people like that, are heavily invested in keeping the fossil fuel industry going the way it's going. And that's, um, that's a heavy lift to oppose those kinds of people when you consider the amount of money they bring to the table in terms of, uh, you know, you know, electing politicians. The good news is, and I was chatting with someone about this earlier, the good news is um, the younger generation of millennials, they really get it. You know, I occasionally get a chance to speak to college students and they are really engaged and really on board because they understand it's going to impact them more than it's going to impact us. It's going to impact them more than it's going to impact us, their children and grandchildren. By the way, that's a fundamental question you have to, everyone has to ask themselves. A couple of fundamental questions here. Do I care about the fate of future generations. Do I care what future generations are going to think about us? Those are fundamental questions because you know we're going to be gone before you know a lot of these problems occur. But our children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, and so forth, they are going to be dealing with this, kind of like what David Attenborough said. Yes. Uh, you gave a figure of uh, 280 parts per million pre-coal. Yes. Now, could you uh, elaborate on that because? Coal was used uh, to burn mm -hmm. before it was used to generate electricity. So, where, what time frame are we talking about? Yeah, when, well, when, yeah. yeah. Well, the industrial revolution actually started back in the 1700s. That's when it started burning coal in a big way. And you're quite right. Back in human civilization, when they had villages and all that, they would dig up coal and they would burn it in their, in their fireplace and things like that. That's pretty minimal compared to the amount of burning of not just coal, but all the fossil fuels in the Industrial Revolution. But it really cranked up right about 1900, and it's been accelerating ever since. And that's, yeah, that's, to do and that's with kind of where electricity came in. Where electricity comes in, where um, you know, um, uh, manufacturing came in. You know, all good things. I mean, we, our lifestyle is, is, is you know, we live a very good life because of all those things. So I'm not saying, let's go back to Hudson and fires and things like that. But we have a great opportunity to, to transition away from fossil fuels because green energy is out there, it's, it's growing really fast. In fact, wind power is now the fourth uh, largest source of power in, on the grid in our country. Number one is, is, is natural gas, uh, number two is coal, number three is nuclear, but wind is four. Hydro is five and solar is six, but solar is coming up fast. And a lot of the, the good news here is uh, the marketplace is simply going to have to say at some point because green energy is just a, just a good deal. Not only in the long term, but even the upfront cost. It actually turns out it's much cheaper to replace, say, a Moss Landing power plant with a solar farm than to rebuild you know, a, a, a gas to plant. It's actually, the upfront costs are actually less. Then in the long term, you save even more. So you're going to see those transitions happening nationally. One thing I like to talk about is, guess what state in the United States is number one in wind power? Wind power. Wind power. It is the ruby red oil-producing state of Texas. 
<laughs> because there's a lot of wind resource down there, it just makes sense economically. Those wind turbines. So it, ultimately, that's going to trump the politics. No pun intended. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, what's going to happen is you know, the renewables are going to are going to are going to come to, to force. Yes. Is there uh, organizations that we can contribute to that are going to fight against these? Yes. In fact, there was an organization right here in Monterey. Well, it's a national organization called the Citizens Climate Lobby, which I'm a member of, CCL. And you can just Google Citizens Climate Lobby and find them on the web. Join, it's free. And there is a Monterey chapter of CCL. I'm, I'm involved in that. And we meet uh, about uh, every other month at the Monterey Library on Saturdays. And, uh, we actually have an event coming up. I think it's on um, on February 25th at uh, MIIS, the uh, Military Institute for International Studies, and Jimmy Panetta will be there and others talking about um, uh, solutions. It's going to be at MIS on the, on the evening, I think, the 25th. Yes. Uh, could you talk briefly about what the military has been doing in terms of climate change and how this might be uh, helpful to civilian? Uh, Uses. Yeah, great question there. You know, the military has been very proactive, very forward leaning on this, and, and partly due to my friend Dave Titley. When he was Admiral Titley, he, he, he initiated something called uh, Task Force Climate Change, and that was the Navy's initiative to deal with climate change. But climate change affects military in, in basically three ways. First is uh, military has to be prepared to deal with changing missions. For example, in the Navy's case, it's the ice free Arctic. You know, there's, you're going to get commerce moving up into the Arctic, and there's going to be competition yeah. between us and the, and the Russians with regard to you know, ensuring that commerce in the Arctic, claiming places in the Arctic. So changing missions. Second area is impact on military bases. There's a real concern about rising sea level and the impact on the Norfolk Naval Base, which is the largest naval base in the world. But there's also problems with melting uh, permafrost affecting radar stations in the Arctic, rising sea levels affecting uh, uh, military installations in the, in the in Pacific. And then finally, um, the military talks about climate change being an accelerant to instability. In unstable parts of the world, it makes them even more unstable. Um, and Afghanistan and Syria are great examples of that. Uh, the thing I mentioned about Bangladesh, another good example. Where are these people going to go? In the case of Afghanistan, the uh, story kind of goes like this. You know, Afghanistan has been in the grip of a, of a terrible drought for, for a number of years. And there really is only one good drought-resistant crop that grows in Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah. You probably don't know what it is, Ethiopian poppy. The source of much of the heroin that comes to the U.S. So uh, the government of Afghanistan, under our urging, has outlawed opium poppy and destroyed it and tried to keep the farmers from growing it. But the Taliban raised their hand and said, hey, okay, Poppy, we love it. You guys can grow all you want, and if it messes up those Americans, even better. <laughs> so guess what's happened? You know, the Taliban has come back, and now they're, they're in control of about two-thirds of the country, and they're going to be at the negotiating table ultimately. So that's a case where climate has a big impact. Mm. The Syrian revolution, you know, again, big drought there, and uh, there was a huge displacement of people from the countryside into the cities, young men who couldn't couldn't find jobs on the farms in the countryside, came to cities, couldn't find jobs there either. And that led to many other factors, but that was also a destabilizing factor, which led to the Syrian civil war, and look where we are trying to deal with that. So there's going to be examples like that happening more and more. And DOD has to be prepared to deal with us, and they spend a lot of time figuring out what the implications of that kind of thing will be. To follow up on the, on the military, yeah. what are they doing to be more economical around environmental footprint? Uh, well, they have a lot of initiatives in trying to become more resilient and, you know, basis with power. And a lot of that has to do with putting up solar arrays and things like that. And I'm not sure about wind turbines, but certainly I've seen uh, solar arrays going out to a lot of military bases. Partly because of the, you know, trying to cut, cut down emissions, but also trying to be more resilient and able to kind of go off the grid if they have to do that. Yes? I saw a very exciting show on Bill Gates' brain. Uh -huh. And the fourth part, with the Gates Foundation, spent uh, a substantial amount of money uh, looking back and starting from scratch and re reinventing or inventing a new type of nuclear reactor mm -hmm. that would run on spent fuel, was safe, uh, and didn't create uh, nuclear waste. 
uh, and they're ready to go. They've gone through the modeling stage, and we're building a prototype and going to phase the next stage, which would be China. And that got shot down because of the tariff situation. Do you, do you know anything about what's happening on this in the latest chapter? Are these a modular reactors, like small modular reactors? Uh, no, this would be a major commercial uh, energy producer. I don't, I don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. the last talk I gave, someone in the audience mentioned small modular reactors, which is a new design. Um, and I did a little bit of looking into that. They are just uh, kind of at the drawing board stage. None has been built yet. There doesn't seem to be a market this for is way, way down the road. Yeah. Uh, let me talk a little bit about nuclear power. I'm not a big fan of nuclear power, but I can tell you of the 80 solutions that Drawdown puts out, uh, nuclear power is number 20 on the list. Uh, but they don't regard nuclear power as a long-term solution. They regard nuclear power as an interim solution. My problem with nuclear power is, um, although it's actually the safest power, if you, if you go back and look at how many people died in nuclear accidents compared to how many people died in other energy accidents, it's actually the safest. There have been fewer deaths. The problem is, you have a catastrophic failure, it can wipe out an area the size of the Monterey Peninsula, make it uninhabitable for 100 years. So you have to design a huge amount of safety into a nuclear reactor because of that potential for catastrophic failure. And as a result, nuclear power is actually very expensive. It's the most expensive power. So that's the first problem. The second problem is, what do you do with the waste? For a long time, the solution there was Yucca Mountain in, in uh, Nevada. And I think that would have probably been a pretty good solution, but back in the early 2000s, Nevada finally woke up and said, yeah. not in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And it's been on hold since then. It's kind of, it's in limbo. It's not, it's not been abandoned, but no work has been done on there, and it's kind of in limbo. So that's the second problem, what do you do with, it, with nuclear waste? Right now, nuclear waste is stored at each site, and that's really not sustainable, not a good idea. And then finally, uh, the last problem is um, you've got a nuclear weapons proliferation problem when you've got nuclear power plants because it isn't that hard to take spent fuel rods and reprocess them into weapons grade plutonium. That's exactly how Kim Jong-un has achieved his nuclear arsenal. There's two routes to the atomic bomb. One's the plutonium route, which involves reprocessing of spent fuel rods. That's what North Korea has done. The other is the uranium route, which involves these centrifuges. So if you have this proliferation of, of nuclear power plants, then there's always the possibility you're going to have you know, more and more nuclear weapons world, not a good thing. Yes? Um, so I'm, I'm interested in how local communities can plan ahead for the changes right around. I live in Pacific Grove. Yeah. What's, what's going to happen and how, and how can the, a small city like PG um, do what needs to be done, even predict what could happen? Yeah. Um, I can tell, I can, the cities have been pretty proactive so far. For example, the city of Monterey invited me to, to, to come there and, and address the city council, which I did. The city of Carmel did the same thing. And I haven't addressed the city of, of the city of Grove, but uh, I, I will tell you that uh, uh, Cynthia um, Garfield. Garfield. Cynthia Garfield was at my last talk, and she was very actively involved. Um, yeah, there are things that cities can do. You know, Get a handle on your on your uh, uh, carbon footprint and start doing things like uh, you know bike trails and encouraging use of electric vehicles and things like that. Okay. Yes. Uh, can you speak to any of the problems that uh, Germany had with their uh, nuclear um, uh, plants and they they were getting I, I guess they're getting away from it. Did it, have to, did it have anything to do with danger, or is it just because of the Green Party? <laughs> I don't like know specifically things. about Germany, but I will tell you, France has been very aggressive in using their compeller. France is kind of the leading country. Yeah, they have the best record, I yeah, suppose, of any other country. Yeah, they're pretty active in, in using nuclear power as, as, a, as a solution. Um, I don't know. I'm, yeah. I'm just not... You can see their nuclear plants when you go along the Rhine River. Yeah. I mean, you didn't, I never read about it in the news, but they're yeah. there and they use them. Yeah, here's, here's another thing I like to say about nuclear power plants. You know, the technology keeps getting better and better. Keep making the designs better, make them safer, and make them safer and safer and safer, which is really great. You want to do that. But I would, I would assert that whenever you have a, a complex hardware, software, and human system, you can't make it 100% safe. And so you have to worry about what's the implications of a catastrophic failure. And in the case of a nuclear power plant, 
implications are huge. So for example, consider jet airliners. You know, jet airliners have been flying for about 50 years, and they keep getting better and better. They keep designing better and better jet airliners, better hardware, better, better software. But guess what? Jet airliners keep crashing. They still crash. And oh, by the way, at least a half a dozen times in my lifetime, they crashed because the pilot said, I think it's a good idea to crash this plane and kill everybody on board. It's happened at least six times since I've been around. And so, you know, what if a nuclear power plant operator decides, I think it's a good idea to blow up this plane? This plane? <laughs> you can't guard against that. I mean, sure, you, you give them psychological tests. Well, guess what? They give pilots psychological tests too. And every now and then, a pilot decides, I'm going to crash this plane. So, you know, you have to look at how catastrophic is the failure. And in the case of nuclear power plant, it's pretty darn catastrophic. Anyone? Oh yes, I um, let's see. Um, yeah, I'm going to put this uh, video of this talk and all my future talks on this YouTube channel. It's called Climate Change Matters with Mike Clancy. You can just go on YouTube, and Google that, or search on that, and it'll come to it. There's one talk on there now already, and I'll put this one on there in a couple weeks, and uh, all my future talks as well. I got a bunch on schedule. So if you're interested in pursuing it further, or if you're contacting me here, and if you're interested in having me come and speak to a, another group or something like that, I'll be happy to talk to you about that. Thank you very much.